Hello everyone, Jim Staley, Passion for Truth Ministries, and Shabbat Shalom. If this is your first time watching this broadcast, we are grateful that you're here. I pray that God will bless you through His Word today, and I pray that as we dive into the original languages, as we dive into the original culture, and we let the Holy Spirit reign a word, act and do what it does, I pray that it will not only challenge you, but it would encourage you and inspire you to walk closer to your King. All right, well, today's message I have entitled, Begin to Possess. You'll see exactly what I mean by that as we walk through the scriptures. We're going to get to that exact phrase. Now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to stop getting, we need to get up off of our backsides, stop sitting on the bench, and play what God wants us to play. We need to get in the game and begin to possess the land. We don't want to be the generation that sits on this side of the Jordan watching everyone else possess the land. Now's the time that we possess the land. And I'm going to suggest to you, uh, as we get started here, that God has been providing steps for you all along the way that maybe you did not even see or recognize was Him because maybe they came in the form of tribulations, uh, maybe they came in the form of suffering, but the conquering King part of your life, the victory is coming and it happens in a moment when we go to possess the land. We're going to see some incredible things in God's Word today, but let's start off in prayer, shall we? Father, we just ask that you would take your Holy Word and illuminate it to our minds. Give us kazon, give us revelation. Let the lightning that comes from heaven, let it open up all of our senses, Lord, our mind, our will, our emotions, the very spirit and fabric of who we are, let it be open to what you want to say to us, God. We love you and we praise you and we ask that you would transform us by the living word, the water that washes over us, gets rid of our dirt and grime, and puts us back into a place of holy submission and transformation unto you. Everybody said amen. All right. All right, so turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin. And uh, let's start off in verse 1. It said, now, let me just give you a backup before we actually get into the scriptures. Devarim, or Deuteronomy, is the second law. It's not really a second law. It's the second telling of the law of God. So this is going to be a really amazing uh, few chapters because it just gives you the whole outline of the Israelite people from the moment that they met God to where they're at today. It's kind of a recap is, is what God is doing and he's flying through, you know, verse after verse, telling where they're at. And that's what we're, we're at right now in chapter 2, is in the middle of this telling of the story of everything that's happening. So then it says this in verse 1, Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skirted Mount Sire for many days. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. Now, this is a pretty amazing phrase in and of itself. It spoke to me significantly because what was happening here is that the, 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 the Israelites were going around and around Mount Seir, Seir for many days. And God said, look, it's time that you stop skirting this mountain. You've skirted it long enough. So we want to turn northward. God says, it's time you move out of the groove that you're in. Some of you are in a place right now where you've been going around the mountain so many times, God says, look, it's time that you stop going around this mountain again. It's time to make a turn. And I believe that turn is northward. That is where the direction that we want to go. We want to head in the direction where God is meeting and waiting for us again. And so some of you right now are going to begin to feel the Holy Spirit begin to move inside of your life. Because this message is not going to be an intellectual, an intellectual message only to tantalize you, to make you go, oh, what a great message. Oh, no, 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 no. I want the Holy Spirit to convict you, to move you, to transform you, and to open up your senses to where you're at in your personal walk. Some of you have been going around the mountain for so long. God says, I'm done with it. It's time to move on, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. and Mrs. Jones and children, you've been going in circles. Now it's time we do a straight line north towards the arms of God. All right, so now let's move forward. That's the setting of where we're going. Verse 3, verse 4, excuse me, and command the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, the descendants of Esau, who live in Sire, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Did you hear what, what God just said right there? 
He said that your enemies are afraid of you and that's why they attack you. Have you ever considered that those that hate you the most are actually jealous and afraid of you? It's like a bear that's backed into a corner, right? He, he comes out fighting, uh, not because he really wants to hurt you. He's afraid of you. And there's nothing more dangerous than someone that's afraid. That person can come out of their shell and go crazy. And, uh, and I've seen that in my own life. Some of the scariest people I've seen are not the big, strong, bulky people. It's the little scrawny guys that you never know what are going to do when they're backed into a corner. So I want you to understand that, that the enemy himself, which is behind all enemies, Satan himself attacks because he's afraid of you. Let that sink in for just a moment, my friends. You hold the blood of Christ flowing through your, 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 your veins. You have the power of the living God. You have the staff of Moses. You have the anointing of Aaron. You have the right to go into the Holy of Holies. You can drink from the chalice because, because you are an heir to the throne. And that is what is absolutely makes Satan scared to death. It is a threat to him, the anointing that you carry. And most of you don't even recognize the anointing that you have on your life because you don't operate in the image to the fullness of that power, which only happens through love. All the characteristics of all the Torah, every commandment, it all is for one direction. It's to bring us into a perfect love relationship with him. So by the way, two things. Number one, the enemy's scared of you, and that's why he attacks you. So if you feel attacked, and I will tell you, I, I, I have felt an extraordinary, an, an extraordinary amount of attack in my life. And it was not until I really read this verse that I fully understood the reason why Satan attacks is he's afraid of us. All the people out there that seem to have amazing lives and no problems and they just move through, there's no threat. If you were Satan, why would you attack someone that does not threaten you, that has no ability to threaten your kingdom? Let you be who you are. But those that have the ability to impact the kingdom of God tend to get attacked more, and that's why. Let's move forward here. Number five says, don't meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as a single footstep, he says, because I've given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. Verse 7, for the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord God has been with you, you have lacked nothing. Do you hear what he said, ladies and gentlemen? We are the modern-day Israelites coming out of Egypt. We are the ones that are trying to find our way in the wilderness. And look what God says. He says, I know you're trudging in the wilderness. And let's just look into the Hebrew word there, trudging. Yalak. Okay, it means uh, uh, to carry a great burden. It means to 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 follow, uh, to bring, to march, uh, to be weak. See, God knows that we're weak. We are just but dust with eyeballs. If you want to know the truth, to give you there a visual, we're like minions. All we are is dust in the wind, as the song goes. And God knows our pain. He knows what you're going through. He knows you're trudging through. But here's the key. Keep walking, right? Like Dory said in Nemo, if you got kids like I do, had six daughters, I think, I think I've seen Nemo a hundred times. Just keep swimming, right? <coughs> Just keep swimming. That's what we want to do. Just keep going through it. We will hit the promised land. Let's keep going. But by the way, he says, you've lacked nothing. So all the complaining that you've done, all the, the issues and the frustration that you've had, you've lacked nothing, says the Lord. I'm with you till the very end. And when we passed by our brethren, we're in verse 8 now. The descendants of Esau who dwelt in Sire, away from the road of the plain, away from Eloth and Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by, by way of the wilderness of Moab. Then Yahweh said to me, do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. 
In verse 10, it says, The Emim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them the Emim. Verse 12, the Horites formerly dwelt in Sire, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. Now, this is an amazing thing. He's setting this up and he's reminding them of this journey because they're about to cross into the, into the promised land. He's reminding them, look, I had you go about, my, about Mount Seir. I had you move through the people of Esau. You had to watch your back and be very, very careful because they're afraid of you. But at the end of the day, I moved you into a land that was filled with giants. So not only did you have to deal with being hungry, you had to deal with the heat, lack of water, constantly frustration, sweat, no deodorant, no daily showers, the amount of frustration and suffering and trudging, as God said, through the wilderness was so thick. And just at the very end, he said, oh, and by the way, I took you through a land that had giants. You see, our lives pattern the biblical Israelites to a T. We are no different than them. We move through this life and we are all taught that everything is about comfort, security, happiness, and all of these things. And if you get the comfort and security and happiness and joy and all those because of the, then great. But we're not promised that until the other side. So we need to stop complaining and recognize that he is with us till the end. There is a reward that we've not lacked anything. I don't care what your social status, your financial status, I don't even care what your physical status is. We are not lacking anything. There is not a void or a gap in your life that God cannot fill in one moment by faith. The reason why we have so much suffering, so much frustration, while we deal so much with this world seems to stick to us, is because we look upon the world and all that it has and all that it's doing to us, and we don't have the Teflon tape of faith wrapped around us, like a tallit wrapped around a rabbi. We need to be like the snakes are even smarter than that. They shed their skin and move on to something brand new. We need to shed this world. Don't let it bother you. We operate in a different kingdom. Be like the men and women of old that were crucified, tarred and feathered on a cross and burned alive. And they smiled in the face of their enemies and loved them all the way to their own cross. Do we do that? No, we spend most of our time crying and manipulating people and complaining about this and all oh, my pastor didn't say hi to me or this and that and the other. I wish my wife was this or that or my husband was nice. But why don't we worship the Lord God in spirit and truth, give him praise and thanks, smile in the face of your own circumstance and let God fill your gap. He only fills the gap of those that look for him to fill it. But if you're looking in other places to fill that gap, I promise you your gap will get larger. Giants are coming. Giants are in your land. But God has overcome the giants already. You see, from beginning of the story, the end was written. Do you understand that? This is not just Bible. This is your life, believer. This is your life. From the very beginning of your life, everything was written. All you have to do is embrace the best that he has for you. When you embrace the best at what Yahweh has for you, you get the best. But when you dive into the world to, to feed the flesh of the gaps, if you're a spouse, if you're, if you're a, a wife out there and your husband is, is a jerk and he's mean to you and, he, and he's leaving gaps in you, if you go to the world to fill those gaps, your gaps will get larger and leave you at death's door. By faith, go to God. He'll fill the gap. There's no, not a gap he can't fill. I've been at the place at the dungeon in the bottom of a prison. I know what it's like to feel the gap. And I remember to this day celebrating Passover on the top of a bunk, of a steel bunk in a nine by seven uh, uh, cell with a guy that hated me, where the guards were trying to get him to kill me with, a, with a, a blanket over my head, 
and reading scriptures out of Exodus, breaking a little bit of a cracker and drinking a juice box that was this big, giving honor and glory to my king on the, on the night before he died. I know what gap looks like, but in came a rushing wind into that cell and filled me up beyond what I can explain to you. And the Holy Spirit rushed out of that place all the dirt and grime, all of the pain and suffering and hurt of my heart, my mind, my flesh, the missing of my family, and the, the love the loving arms of the Lord Yeshua, Jesus Christ, came and wrapped themselves around me, and I felt like I was in the presence of the King. Don't say that you've got gaps that God can't fill. He will be ready, and He's ready right now. Just be willing to open up by faith and let Him fill Him. Don't take the bait of the enemy in any way, shape, or form. So here we go. Verse 13 is the beginning of the process of God giving us instructions. He says, now rise up and cross over the valley of Zered. So we crossed over the valley of Zered. And the, and the time we took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of Zered was 38 years. Did you hear that? From the time that they rose up from Kadesh Barnea. We're talking Kadesh Barnea is 11 days journey. To the promised land. Took them 38 years. My friends, how many times does God say, rise up, woman of God. Rise up, man of God. Rise up, child of God. It's time to go. But in, in, in its only plan for God is 11 days to get you to breakthrough. But in the process, we make it 38 years. Brothers, I, I, I can humble myself before you and say, I know what God showed me, and I thought that I knew the direction that He wanted me to go, and I knew that this is the... And then uh, 38 years. I've had my own 38 years. We all feel like we know we're going in the right... But the heart motivation is evil. And we don't know our own hearts of why we do what we do. But when we just let God and we humble ourselves before Him, we just love with no return. 11 days, and it's over. Any of us could go through the worst pain that, that, that life can throw if we only knew it was 11 days. You see, God's desire for your life is 11 days. The enemy's desire is 38 years. It was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord had sworn to them. Verse 15, For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were consumed. Do you know why they were consumed? Why God said, look, this is the way it's going to be. It was a lack of faith. They didn't believe God. God said, honor your mother and father. Don't believe him? 38 years. God said, honor those in authority. Respect them. Even if they mess up, let me judge them. Don't do it? 38 years. Some of you go from church to church to church, and you're waiting for things to be perfect. And when you can't control or manipulate or get things to where you're going, you just quit and go to the next one. 38 years. Instead of just sitting and allowing God to change you, Work on your side of the street. Everyone's trying to work on everyone else's side of the street. And their side of the street's got trash all over it. Yeshua is coming to your street and he wants to see you cleaning it. And the moment he sees your head come up for any other reason than to look into his eyes, you will be chastised. You will be passed over in your potential Blessing, reward, and the interview for your next promotion, you'll lose. Because God's not interested in you pointing out everyone else's shortcomings, everyone else's downfall. God is interested in one thing, you getting back to the garden and possessing the land that the enemy stole from you. It's your inheritance that he stole. 
Don't worry about someone else's inheritance. If their theology is wrong, their theology is wrong. God is big enough if they are really studying theology. Because you know what theology is? It's two words. It's theo, and it, which is God, and ology, which is the study of. If they're truly studying God, they will come back around and meet God face to face. So let me just say something for a moment. I feel really inspired. I was talking to one of my uh, employees uh, here at Passion for Truth, and we had this wonderful discussion over WhatsApp about the power of God in relationship to the Torah. You see, God's instruction manual, His commandments, His Bible, the Word of God, is simply guardrails. And this is it right here. This is the Word of God. But you know what? I can't hug this. It can't hug me. It does nothing for my relationship to one another. To it, You know what it does? It points me in the right direction. It's a billboard. It's a Siri. Right? It's Alexa, if you will. It's your GPS. It tells you it's your Google Earth. It tells you where you are at and where you should be. But it has no ability to change your heart. It cannot infect you from the inside out. You know what that's called? That's called Yeshua relationship until you know Him and you love Him and you baste yourself, you marinate yourself. We spend more time, you might think this is a funny analogy, but we spend more time preparing barbecue and marinating steaks than we do marinating in the Word of God every day. We spend more time in other areas of our life, social media, Facebook, Instagram, watching the news. I'm a little guilty of that than we do in prayer and study and meditation. And, 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 and look, I will tell you, meditation is probably one of the most powerful parts of the Christian experience that you could ever have. What is, what is the difference between prayer and meditation? Prayer is talking to God and praising Him and thanking Him. Meditation is shutting your mouth and listening with the two ears that you have. My mom used to always tell me, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You need to listen twice as much as you speak. I've struggled with that ever since. <laughs> but this is what we need to do with God. We need to get alone with Him and let Him infect us. Because it's the relationship with Yeshua, with Christ, that's going to change you. If you've got character issues, if you've got addictions, if you've got problems in your marriage, brethren, I can assure you, Yes, practical application. I help people with their marriages all the time. We, we do a lot of marriage counseling. But I can tell you the number one problem in marriage is their love relationship, not with one another. It's with Christ. I haven't met someone that loves God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Both parties love God and have marriage problems. Yes, we're going to have issues, but problems are different. Problems go to the heart and you can't keep enough commandments to change the heart, it will only condemn you or bless you. And it defines sin. That's all God's law does. It defines sin, blesses, and curses. There's nothing in there that says it transforms your heart. That's what the Spirit does. This is why, my friends, the glasses that we have, that you have on right now, Perhaps is someone's told you that keeping the commandments is where it's at, that that's what we got to do. I'm telling you right now, until you put on the glasses of the Spirit of the living God and put goggles on, not just glasses, but full-on waterproof goggles, you cannot get into the water of the Word. It will drown you. You won't see it. It's like going underwater and opening your eyes, diving into the Word of God without swimming goggles. You won't see clearly. You'll get it all messed up. Theologies will overturn. And therefore, there's so many different ideas about how, what about the, the prophecies of, of when he's going to come back? And what about the calendar issue? And how do you keep this commandment? And, and how do you follow God this way? The, why is there so much of this? Because people don't have, they're, they're swimming with eyeglasses on. Put the goggles of the Spirit on and everything becomes clear. Amen. All right, speaking of, let's get back to the Word of God because it has far more to say than I could. Uh, 
Let's start in verse 16. So it was when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me, saying, This day you are to cross over at Ar, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near the people of Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them. For I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I've given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. I think we just read this, but maybe the Lord had me reread this, because this is really important. It says right here, do you notice it says, don't harass them. Now, we don't normally get the idea that the Israelites are going around and they're aggravating people like, like you know, my children do sometimes, all the time, I should say. You know, my younger ones aggravating, poking each other in the ribs, you know, constantly, stop aggravating your sister. Stop, you know, what's the word he uses here? Stop harassing them. But, but, but this is a lot of times how we get problems in our life. We harass people. We aggravate them. We, we are in their business. Look, if you're not supposed to, God doesn't have you in authority in someone's life, stay out of their business. Pray for them. But stay out of it. You'll keep yourself from so many problems. And look, I know I don't even know if days of our lives or as the world turns is still a show today like it was when I was a kid. I never got into that thing, but I know a lot of housewives did. But I don't like drama. The least amount of drama brings more peace. So remove the drama from your life by stop harassing people, stop getting into other people's business, pull out and focus on your own walk with God. Amen. Verse 20, it says, that was also regarded as land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. A people a great and numerous as tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place. Just as he had done for the descendants of Esau, who dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them, they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place even to this day. Verse 23 says, And the Avim, who dwelt in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaphtarim, who came from Kaphtar, destroyed them and dwelt in their place. So no matter what kind of giants came in front of them, God took care of them. All they had to do was keep on swimming, keep trudging. Rise. Here we go. Do you see this word again? Rise. You know what that word is in Hebrew? That word is kum. There's two really main Hebrew words for, for arise. Nasa, I, I kind of look at it as Nasa, the idea of rising up, and, and then kum. Kum is, is uh, like to be established. It's to, it's to stand up. It's to confirm. It's to raise. Whereas, uh, whereas Nasa is more like rising up. And, and moving in, in direction. This is more kind of a metaphorical is, 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 is standing up for something, confirming something. So I love this beautiful word because in Hebrew, verse 24 is, is, is not just rise, like in English, like rise, all rise when a judge comes. No, it is, it is confirm what I'm about to tell you. Confirm the promise by taking possession of the land. Get up off of your bum and start moving in a direction, and you confirm the covenant. Covenant of God is only confirmed when we do the covenant of God. That's when it's confirmed. All the blessings, all the promises only happen when we do. All the blessings and all the promises, let me say it again, only happen when we do. Cross over the river Arnon. Look, I have given it into your hand. Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. And this is it right here. Listen carefully. This was the title of this message. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. He says, begin to possess it. And then right before that, he says, I gave him into your hand. Now, wait a minute. I, I gave him into your hand. Now begin to possess it. When did, they, when did God give the enemy into their hand? When they, listen, brethren, when they began to possess it. You see, God has given you power, authority. He's not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. For, for those out there that want a fantastic marriage, you must begin to possess it. And that means that you got to stop acting like the Israelites that spent 38 years just complaining against Moses. Because marriages are not built on the past. They're not built on complaining. They're not built on, on the pointing of the finger. They're not built on challenging. They're built on possessing. 
your own soul first. You want a great marriage? Begin to possess it. You want great relationships? Begin to possess it. You want the power of the living God to flow through you? Then begin to get into the river where there's resistance and it's uncomfortable and let the power of God begin to flow through you. Begin by beginning. Take that first step, ladies and gentlemen, because here's what I wanted to show you. The word begin here is halal. And this word has the idea of taking a piece of wood, a hollow piece of wood, and boring a hole in it like you would a flute. You guys say, well, Jim, that's a strange definition. No, think about it. The word begin in this scripture is not the idea of just like taking a step. It's the difficult process of boring a hole in something for the purpose of creating music. Wow, think about that. Your calling on your life is worship. And worship happens on the deepest soul level when we go through something, when we have a challenge, and we decide to not complain, but we are, going to, we are going to bring forth the glory flute of God in our life by, by beginning to serve Him where we're at, wherever that may be, and letting God bore the hole in our lives. Do you feel holy? No. Some of you don't feel holy. Sometimes I don't feel very holy. I don't act very holy all the time. But the kind of holy that God's looking for is that every time that there is a struggle in your life and you're facing a giant, you're facing the giants. And you begin to praise Him. You're boring a hole in your life. And that hole makes you holy unto Him. Because now He can blow through you. And what happens to the air, the ruach in Hebrew? When the Spirit of the living God blows through you, where does that wind go? In a flute. It goes out of the holes. Every challenge of your life is designed to create more holiness. Play on words, another hole in your life. And every time you have a hole in your life, God will be glorified through it. The world will see and hear a frequency that's coming out of you because you came out on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, let this day be told. I've gone through some things, I've gone through some hurt, and it has taken me three years post to get to a place where I recognize that what God's just trying to do in my life is play a new song, a new frequency, let the Holy Spirit come through to not be ashamed of the holes in my life, the mistakes that I've made in my past, that God humbled me to bring me to a place where not to crush me, to remake me, just like He wants to remake you. The potter is not, is not a potter to destroy clay. He's a potter to take clay and make them into the most beautiful vessels that he can use in the king's palace. And sometimes they get to a place where he's got to start over. And when we begin halal, when we let him bore holes in our life by focusing on our side of the street, what he will do is make you into a frequency that will change the atmosphere in your own home, in your community, in your church, and the world. If God's people today would stop complaining and stop looking over here and stop looking over there, and literally we say, get right with God. How do you do that? By letting Him bore the hole in you. Stop boring someone else's wood. Stop drilling in someone else's heart. It's not your responsibility to, to, to point out their weaknesses and to point out all their problems unless you are their authority and your motivation is love and restoration like a father with his children. It is my responsibility as a father to point out the issues that my, my kids have as they grow and help lovingly point and gently point them back north. No more going around... 
My job is to point them to the Father out of love. So when I criticize my children, I never do critique them in the Word of God. So if you want to love someone, critique them in the Word of God. But if your motivation is anything other than, and if you miss one little moment, you get it wrong even in the recesses of your heart. Matthew chapter 5 says that, that, or chapter 7 says that in the same matter that you messed up, God is going to judge you. You will be judged just like that. Therefore, love covers a multitude of sins. Not critique. Love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. Let's continue. So we're beginning to possess it, engage him in battle. Oh, you know, Holy Spirit wants to stick on this verse. Ah, it's the theme of the whole message, so why not? Begin to possess it, and then it gives us another instruction. Engage him in battle. You see, for, for too long, we, we, we hide behind our spirituality, and we are on a, in a position of defense. But if you're going to defeat the enemy and the giants, you must engage in battle. And ladies and gentlemen, my Bible tells me we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of this present darkness in short. It is the devil that attaches itself through trauma in our lives years and years ago in your past that then affects you, infects you, and amplifies your problems today. The problem is not your wife. The problem is not your husband. The problem are not your children. The problem is not the world. The problem is not flesh and blood. It's the enemy, plain and simple. It is the serpent of old that is manipulating man using its carnal weaknesses and its flesh. And that's why Jesus was so kind to the woman at the well. Yeshua saw past all of the garbage and saw a hurting young girl that was likely not loved by her father and was looking for love to fill the gap in all the wrong places. And he said, now look, go and sin no more. You can do this. Today, the religious zealots would condemn, cast out, and castrate. That's what we do. Man, woman, or child, we condemn, cast out, and castrate their hearts before God. And we create more agnostics and atheists than we ever would do if we just loved people where they're at and kindly, gently, like we do with, with children, or we're supposed to do with children, and point them back. But you must engage the enemy in, in battle. What does that mean for you perp- your personal life? If you've got an addiction, if you've got a problem, if you've got an issue, you've got an anger problem, you've got to engage it in battle. Spend time researching your issue, getting help, therapy, reading books, watching videos, educate yourself, and then then ask the Father to reveal to you how to get victory in that area of your life. You have to engage Him in battle. But what the enemy's really good at, brethren, is getting us focused on everybody else's issues, everybody else's giants, and we never, ever possess our own land. Begin to possess your destiny by engaging the enemy on your issues. Watch this, my friends. When we do this, you get to read the next verse. When you begin to possess the land and you possess the victory by engaging the enemy properly through the sword of the Spirit, by the way, then you get this. Verse 25, read it with me. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole of heaven, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. When you begin, when you stop just sitting there and and, and complaining about everything, when you begin, when you let the Holy Spirit work on you and drill holes in you and you focus on what God wants to do in your life, you are creating a musical frequency that comes from the courts of heaven. It blows through you. You create the glory through the tribulation, through the weakness. This is where God says, where you are weak, I am strong. Where is that flute the weakest? It's at the place where it's been bored. It's the whole And it's fascinating to think about that the very weakness of that flute is at the place that the whole exists. And yet at the whole is the fullness of the Spirit of God that comes out of it. 
The weakness, it's like the weakness of the earth is the hole that the geyser then comes out 100 feet in the air. Go to Yellowstone and see Old Faithful. The weakness of the earth proves the greatest power within. The power is so thick, my friends, it's got to find its way to the surface. And it most often finds its way to the surface in the weak spots of our heart. Do not diminish your weakness, says the Lord. Some of you need to hear this. Do not look down on what you think is weak and then be envious and jealous of other people's strength in your weakness because God says, it's in that weakness that I am made strong. It's in that hole in your heart that I will blow. And the most beautiful frequency, the most beautiful sound will come through your weakness if you just trust me. I will put the dread of the nations upon you with a single sound from a single flute in a single hand. Let's drop down to verse 30. It says, But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass through. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. Brethren, have you ever considered As God said, look, he said, you're going to go through the king of Heshbon. And I'm going to give you his throne in all of the lands that he rule. But he's not going to, he's not going to let you just walk by. And the reason why I'm doing that, says the Lord, the reason why you're going to have a hard time is because I want you to have more land. You see, if the king of Heshbon, if all of these kings, let them pass through, There is no promised land. There's no Canaan. God hardened their heart, brought to the surface their own insecurity, their own weakness, and their own fear, and God turned their fear, the enemy's fear, into their victory. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why God says that you you, you do not have a spirit of fear. I did not do what I've done And have my son die on a cross for you to have a spirit of fear. I have given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Because there is a principle, ladies and gentlemen, in the universe of God. And it says that fear produces victory. And you get to choose which side you're on. Do you want your fear to be someone else's victory? Or do you want the enemy's fear to be your victory? We get to choose. He says, I hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand. Your trials, your tribulations, the things you go through are designed to give you more territory in him, to grow your armor, to make your image brighter. Let it happen. Don't be afraid of it. Look for it. It's coming to a theater near you. The entire Christian world is under the delusion that before the Messiah comes, they're, they're, he's just going to resurrect them out from the great tribulation. As if the entire Bible was not written and no one had ever read anything in the Bible about God using tribulation to iron out the wrinkles, to produce an endurance in us, consider it a great joy to face trials of many kinds. If we're to consider it joy to face minor trials, how much more should we consider it joy to go through the greatest tribulation man has ever seen? The church needs it. His people need it. It's not the world he's trying to fix through tribulation. It's us because we refuse to operate by faith. We're constantly leaning on our own understanding. Verse 20, uh, 31, the Lord said to me, See, I've begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. And here we go again. Begin to possess it. Begin to possess it. And then I want you to skip down to to chapter 3, verse 3. It says, So the Lord our God also delivered into our hands uh, Og, king of Bashan, with all his people. And we attacked him until there was no survivors remaining. You see, it's not enough to say, I want to have a good marriage 
Or it's not enough to say, I want to know God with all my heart and then face the first trial and begin to fall apart and retreat. No, we do not retreat in the faces of our enemy. Even when you fall and they strike you down, God has said in his word that not a hair on your head can ever be touched without emotion from the enemy going before the courts of heaven. So why do we fear anything but the king? No one can hurt you. No one can touch you. Anger is a choice. If you find, somebody needed to hear that. Anger is a choice. If it's not a demon, it is a choice. And so when you're faced with someone aggravating you and assaulting you, it is your choice of whether you fall on your face like Moses did before the living God and stay in the middle of the storm, in the eye of the storm, where it's sunny, because the storm is always going to be there. Your question is, where are you at in the storm? Where are you in your walk with God? What kind of time do you put in to sit in His presence? You know, throwing a steak on the grill right, right out of the freezer doesn't work so well. It's got to be tenderized. It's got to thaw out. It's got to be in the presence of flies. And you got to be there, you know, uh, to protect it. It's got to be seasoned. It's got to be salted. It's got to be marinated. And then you know what happens when that meat starts to feel like, man, this is amazing. All these people are massaging me and taking care of me and putting these amazing spices on me. And he has no idea that what's about to come next are the giants is the hellfire of that grill. But ladies and gentlemen, it is the hellfire of the grill that makes the stripes on that steak, like the stripes on Yeshua himself. It's what creates the brilliant flavors that explode in your mouth. The purpose of the hellfire is to get you to a place where you have favor and flavor that God can savor. The world is looking for a few good men and a few good women, just maybe even a child that actually believes this stuff, that begins to possess the gates of their enemies. My friends, can I leave you with this thought? Now is the time and today is the day. Mark this day on your calendar. Today is the day. Say, today is the day. Say it. Today is the day. I will possess the gate of my enemy. I will possess the gate of my enemy. And you will walk by faith. You don't have to figure it out. You don't even have to know how you do it. But what you need to know is God by faith, I don't know how to do this. What Pastor Jim is saying, I have no clue. But I do know that you by faith know and you will take me around the mountain and you will say, now is the time to turn north. Now is the time to turn towards me, says the Lord. Stop turning towards this and that and everything else. You're not going to find peace and rest. And I'm telling you, the number one thing everyone's looking for is peace. You won't find it anywhere else but Him. He is the Shabbat. He is the Shalom in Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat means nothing without the Shalom. And that Shalom in Hebrew encapsulates all the power, all the glory, all the potential, all of the blessing that could ever be given for every category of your life, I give unto you this day. That's what it means when you say shalom to someone. It's not just hello. It's may everything that the power of the living God can possibly give you in every category of your life, may it be unto you. And I say that to you today. Father, in Yeshua's name, I pray for my brothers and my sisters in the Lord right now. God, we just confess before you that we don't spend enough time letting you massage us, letting, letting you marinate uh, in us and through us. The spice and the salt of life, sometimes it hurts in the wounds that the enemy has created over time. And we confess that we need you. We confess that we can't do it without you. We confess, Father God, that our weaknesses, we've looked at them as weaknesses. But it's only through the eyes of man that they are weaknesses. The holes in our heart that have been drilled by someone else. 
is the very cavern that your spirit is looking to move through the most. Forgive us for our backwards thinking. And forgive us, God, for diving into the water of your word without the goggles of your spirit. And I pray, God, with everything in me, that you would transform our lives to be more like you, to make an impact in this world, to stand up, to rise, to begin to possess the gates of our enemies, to take new territory that you've promised. In Yeshua's name, amen. My friends, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, then I pray that you will have the courage, the zeal, the patience, and the love for your fellow man to let God bore the holes in you and to use them to expose the Ruach spirit of the living God through you more now than ever before. Open your eyes to see that all your scars are nothing but holes in the flute for him to play. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be lifted up over you. And may he give you, at the end of your day, shalom. My friends, if this ministry, if this message has blessed you, I pray that you'll share this message with everybody that you meet. I pray that you would support us, connect with us. Go to passionfortruth.com right now. Check out all the other materials. Go to our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Help us get this message out. We need your help to do that. It's our life goal and our mission to take this message and the things that God gives us put it into multiple languages and minister to those around the globe. Until next time that we meet, my friends, I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries. Shalom. If this video blessed you, I encourage you to watch this video and this video as well. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on those notifications. Check out our Instagram page at Jim Staley Official and visit our website at passionfortruth.com. In the meantime, I'm Jim Staley and I'll see you in the next video.